All right, everybody, thanks for joining us here today for a bit of a series of lightning talks or a little bit of short talks on cluster resource management. I appreciate everybody joining here today. Uh, this talk was put together as a result of an effort that you may have seen uh, to collect information on what folks in our community are leveraging for cluster resource management. And we had quite a few interesting replies, uh, which I'll provide a summary of shortly after the lightning talks that you're most definitely waiting for. Uh, and as part of that survey, we did have a, a few folks volunteer to provide some insights on their use of cluster resource management tools to our community, which we're really grateful for. Uh, so without further ado, I'll introduce our first speaker, uh, Simone Gilbo from the Université Laval is going to speak to us on cluster resource management using XCAT and Puppet. Please take it away, Simone. Hello, thank you. So I'm Simone Gilbo from Université Laval. So I'm from Calque, Quebec, which is a, a group of, well, at least on the sysadmin side, it's four university, but at least for the user, all university in Quebec. And we're also part of the Canadian Federation. So I'll just present what we do locally, but some we also have some of our stuff that is being used across Canada. So locally, we have two main clusters and in the same data center in Montreal called Bedugan Narval, which have been deployed well in 2019 and 2021 during the pandemic. And for both of these clusters, we're now using XCAT and Puppet. But we have been using XCAT and Puppet independently for at least five, seven years inside Calque Quebec in, in all the cluster, like a small GPU cluster called Idios with maybe 20 GPU, uh, well, a few hundred GPU back, uh, back in the days. So now we have pushed the system onto, it's called them a medium sized cluster with about 2000 nodes in total. And so one of the thing is because these two clusters were not deployed at the same time, well, we had to support both CentOS 7 and Rocky 8 simply because CentOS 7 was end of life before the end of life of Narval. So day to day, we still need to manage both and keep the same, somewhat to the same level of access to our user without them seeing any difference. So we are now running seven and eight but the next cluster that will be praised, Beluga, when it expires in a, probably in next year or in two years, will be probably on Rocky 9. So we'll, we will probably need to support three OS at the same time. So one of the things we use, we, we use XCAT, like the Tesla the protection says, but we don't use it. We only use XCAT to manage like the DHCP, TFTP, and just like launching stateless node and some disk full node for management server. So in there, we use our power, we use the con server of XCAT. And we also use like the built-in uh, resource, not, re uh, not a resource management, but resource configuration, like the number of, like the node config itself, the host name, the MAC address. And you, we use that database to generate other files like for Pernis and Custer Shell, these are now dynamic. So when we add a new node, we just add one line in, into the config of XCAT, just basically the host name, the IP, and the MAC address. And then when it's defined there, the primitive server and the cluster shell will just update our config. So it will be added automatically to the, our monitoring software. And since they are also stateless nodes that is on the compute side, they will just boot up the latest images and just join the cluster. So the image are built on the XCAT server, but the we don't really use what well, if you use XCAT and if you use that maybe 10 years ago because of our old program, by default, XCAT will tell you to create probably like shell script to do all of your config once you boot the node. But that will mostly happen only when you boot the node. So instead of doing that, we use Puppet to run it when the node boot and then just every 30 minutes on state on like on our management server and once a week on the computer just to print drift on the configure on the config on each server. So like the minimum is done with the next cat, but it's it can do a lot more than we do. We, like they added support for REST API and other stuff like that, but we don't really need it 
day to day. So one of the key things that we like about our stack currently is the stateless images. So that one will force us to ensure that everything is done, is repeatable inside Puppet and Xcat. So we, we know that if we reboot a node, it will come back and will be completely stateless, but it's also, it's not an NFS export. So after the node, the, the node is online, we can still modify it with Puppet. So if we, if, if we need to add, and let's say, a, a monitoring software on the node, well, we add it in Puppet, we run Puppet on all the node, and it will be added. We don't need to reboot the compute, the compute node to, to change that, like it will be the case with the NFS export or something like that. So, and also all the scientific software are in CVMFS, which is a distributed CVMFS file system might CERN. So locally, or we don't need an NFS endpoint to start a scientific software. The, and any analyst can push update without touching the image of the of the OS itself. And the nodes are also independent, so they don't require NFS server to be always online. Once they're booted, it's fine. We can we can do anything we want with the project server. They are not really needed. And it do take memory, so it's about like three and a half gig of memory, but new server are like 256 gig and more. So it's 1% and we still have local disk in them, but when you use it for the cache and the slurm term, term there. And that one, since it's only temporary stuff in there, well, we, we wipe it after boot. And while, while we do that, well, we, we encrypt it. So if we need to replace a part or anything, there is nothing useful on those disks. And the way it works when we build the image with XCAT, we have a list of packages we want. And so when Puppet will run after the boot, most of the software are already there. So it will only maybe configure like the syslog server and a few things like that. But it's maybe take 30 seconds to one minute to just finish up the config. So the only thing that we do need to reboot the compute for is for kernel upgrade. But when we do that, we use the Slurm uh, the Slurm reboot command, so it will it will prevent a job from running on both version images. So once we run the reboot command and everything, we can be sure that all the new job will be on the new on the new image when it's done. And if a node is down while we do that upgrade, if it's a state of full node, then it will not get upgrade. But since we are stateless, well, if the node is repaired, it will boot up to the latest version. So we don't really need to track uh, a we don't really need to verify that the update was done everywhere because it will be when the, everything is rebooted. So we do keep uh, maybe a list of five images of all, all the old image. So if a problem with like the NVIDIA driver happens, we can just reboot the compute node to the previous version and replicate the problem. Or if somebody got a specific problem with the compute node, well, we can also, we can reboot that node and verify if the problem is still there. If it's not there after the root, well, maybe it was, maybe it's not our work, maybe something, uh, at least we can isolate the problem with that node. And while well, I said we have the compute and login node stateless, we also have the, the lost or server that are diskless. And so that one was used maybe two years ago. I think we upgraded that from 2.10 to 2.12 while the cluster was live. So we just, uh, do a failover on half the node, reboot up that, that section of the cluster on the new images, do another failover, restart them, and then all the nodes were on the latest version that was tested on a smaller system before. And maybe two months ago, we added uh, maybe 10 petabytes of storage. It was uh, maybe 10 OSS. We just booted up the same image, the, the same luster image that what the author server were, were running, and just run Puppet on them and formatted them in, it was available and we're, we were sure it was exactly the same version. So we were running, running in production. Uh, so in Puppet, the difference with Ansible is mostly that you have a decorative language and it's it's a, it's a client that will pull the config instead of Ansible where it's the, when it's like SSH that going on each node and run the, the command themselves. So the decorative language is, well, you, you need to learn another language, language, but it's not really complicated. It's mostly modifying files and like starting services. So 
it's mostly always the same resources that you need to modify. And we can you can define resources in there. So compared to Ansible, it will not run all your resources as, as like line by line. It will check the dependency between them. So if you know that you depend on our service, you don't really need to check when it's running because you need to declare it correctly. And then it will do the dependency management for you and running in the correct order. Uh, so in there, we all the variable are using YAML. So, and we have like a, <clears throat> not a complex hierarchy, but we have multiple levels. So the fur, like the top one, like there, the host name is pretty, is pretty much this more specific one that will apply only to one node. So the one with the, that specific host name, but we are also other layers. So the trusted, that certain name, uh, but there, like the compute.yaml, if we have any config, like I know you limit config, we can put it there in compute.yaml. If we have anything that applies only to GPU node, we also have the compute type level. And then we have also the OS level. So since we support both CentOS 7 and Rocky 8, we have two config files for that because it's not the same YAML repo in there. And finally, in the common.yaml, we have everything that's common on the cursor, like the, <clears throat> like the IP address of the management server. So the firewall is configured to allow them SSH, SSH access. We also store the secret into YAML, but they are encrypted with GPG. And the decryption is done on the Spopet server. So if we need to put any password, they are still within Git, but it's just a big blob that you you really can't really read until you have the key to access that. And it, when we do make modification, we we create multiple branches to the Git repo for each feature that we want. And then we can merge that code review before merge that to master. And we can also test those branch because R10K will do the module management and will create an environment per Git branch. So if we can test any config, we will, any config, any Test we want, we can test them on a compute node with either no op or just running for real on a node. And once it works and we know that it's done, when, then we can merge that onto the master on the get on the master git repo. So by default, Puppet will run on boot and every 30 minutes. So all of our management node, login node will run that every 30 minutes. So and sometimes it will fix some issues. Sometime in the past we had maybe SSSD that died for some reason that we cannot really tell for now, but at least every 30 minutes it will restart it. So if it's only happened every three months, at least it will fix themselves. And on the compute node, since we don't really want to take CPU time to run Puppet, we run, only run it every boot and just every week, just in case there are some config drift in there or somebody modifies something to the Git repo that's not really important, but we'll still want that someday on the compute node. But when, when we do make a major modification inside Puppet, well, we can run that with the cluster shell on every node. That will take a few minutes, but just running the background fixing the small change we have done. And in that case, cluster shell is also using the, the dynamic config of XCAT. So, if we had a node, that comment is still valid. We don't have to check any, anywhere else to get, get a list of the compute node we have. So by default, Puppet is mostly made to, to be on stateful node because when you start a client, it will request a certificate on the master and it will be asked, it will be asked to be signed and you cannot do that twice with the same host name. So what we do to fix that is we generate a generic certificate in our case, all the compute node, instead of, uh, instead of having one certificate by host name, we have one certificate just called compute that distributed all the compute node. And we modify a bit the config of the puppet server to allow that compute cert name to, to pull any, any compute catalog. So like compute one, we will we'll just we use the, the cert name compute and we'll be able to pull the config compute new a uh, compute two if it wants. So and that's the thing we need to be careful with that is that certificate do cannot be inside the image itself because that image is available with TFTP and HTTP. 
So it will need to be pushed after the node is booted by XCAT, but that's a feature. It's a syncless feature within XCAT. So it's already done. It just needs to be done correctly. So the user cannot grab our secret from there. And by default, within when we boot a new node, a new management node, we just post, we, we put just a basic config in there that include like the firewall and TP system and the basic monitoring. So at least a new node is somewhat secure. And we also put like just a little notify in there just to tell the, the sysadmin that yeah, it, it's not defined yet into the config just to, so you can do that later. And in the base config, we also have some, one, one Red Hat, Red Hat publish some CV, sometimes they will put, they will put also some work around like disabling network namespace or stuff like that, that recently happened. So by adding base config on all, all of our node, including compute node, login and management node, well, we can push that, that workaround or remediation on all the node with a simple commit. And then 30 minutes later, it's on all the nodes of the cluster. Uh, th that's uh, some example of the thing we did about or do on all the nodes, like disabling open V switch or USB key that we also disable. So just a few lines, I pop it, and then it's we don't have to, to do that config anywhere, it's done. And since the node, the state of those are can be modified after boot. Like one of the, <clears throat> sometimes we only update the package as we want. So instead of building a new images, we can do uh, just upgrade the pocket package if we need to. So just simplify our patch management. If we don't, we don't need to reboot everything. We just patch the, the RPM itself. So thank you. Is there any question or? Awesome. Thank you so much, Simon, for joining our call today and sharing that information. That was really, yeah, really helpful, especially as someone that's considering what cluster manager tool to use next. Um, so yeah, um, if folks have any questions, uh, please do unmute or ask your questions in the chat. Does anybody like to ask questions of Simo at this moment. I have only made notes of things I need to change over here. And I hope I will learn something on your cluster <laughs> or coffee. Yeah, 100%, likewise. Are, are you doing any type of discovery on your clusters when you install uh, them? Any discovery within XCAT or within the pocket? Within XCAT, yeah. Uh, no, so the way it works and when the cluster is being end over by the vendor from the RFP, we just tell them to give us just a, just a spreadsheet with like the MAC address and node location. So that's what mostly ought to be used. But yes, XCAT do support some automatic discovery. I think you can boot all the node in the correct order and it will give you like a it will create its database itself of MAC address and no right, location. yeah. So we we do it based off the the port location on the in row switches. So yeah. I so yeah, if you were doing stuff. Yeah, so we don't use that, but yeah, there's there's a lot of possibility with an XCAT. Excellent, thanks, Evan. What other questions do folks have for Simo? Oh, I see one uh, yeah. in the chat. Um, yeah, so the vendor did use XCAT, but it was independent. So the cluster were, were, is a Dell cluster, but it was installed by CDW. But since they know we, we will use XCAT, they used XCAT and they just provide us with our config. But we are not using any of the vendor stuff. So once the Accent tests were done. We just wiped everything you done. Well, we act, we just disconnect the management server that we are they were using, <laughs> just in case, and we use other management server to install our own stack. So they did use Xcat. Yeah, great question, Sai. What other questions do folks have for Simon? Jonathan 
Scone from NERSC. Hi, Simone. I wanted to, so you're managing um, more than one operating system distribution. So you have Rocky and also CentOS because of the end of life of CentOS. Yeah. Um, what what challenges with say managing those two different images? I imagine it's not terribly difficult in XCAT um, to use say Red Hat uh, derivatives uh, that that are not so different. But can you with XCAT manage say Debian based and uh, you know Red Hat derivatives? In, in yeah, we do. Yeah, point? we have a, a OpenStack cluster that's running Ubuntu. And, but the, the base install was done with XCAT, like installing Ubuntu in there. But after that, it's running, well, since it's OpenStack, it's running uh, OpenStack Ansible. But yeah, you can boot other OS with XCAT. So we also install Sonic and Cumulus on the switch with only base with XCAT. So it's not really okay. an issue. The, the only problem we had, I think, in the past is but, you but cannot I, I, use a CentOS 7 XCAT when star Rocky 8, if I remember correctly. But you can do the opposite way. Okay. So I, I was the question is more directed at like when you're baking the image, if you know you're using say management or service node for doing that and it is already has a flavor, particular flavor, and you're using something that's wildly different, how how difficult that is to yeah, so so in our case, they are independent. So we don't build like the the Rocky Eight image is built on a XCAT on a XCAT with Rocky Eight. We don't cross build the images. So. Okay. Yeah, I th I think I think on the other half of well, Simon's not doing Open HPC literally, but Open HPC has 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 had support for XCAT in the past. Currently currently only supports werewolf if you didn't know werewolf uh, allegedly i've never tried it will let you have a uh, manage a debian type image from a in our case a rocky uh, werewolf host i see well i i think there's more challenges now with werewolf 4 that um i, I at least was not willing to go down that that, that, is, that is another thing we are not on four yet yeah. Awesome. Great question, Jonathan, and appreciate you chiming in there, Mike. And I'm going to use this as a segue um, to hand it over to you to start sharing your screen. Uh, I see there's one more question in the chat uh, directed towards Simon. Um, we can either, Simon, you can feel free to answer that in the chat, or we'll be taking questions for both groups um, once uh, Mike's question period is up and I have a little blurb to give on the survey itself. So just in the essence of time, uh, with okay. that, I'm going to pass it over to Mike. All right. Thanks. Hey, uh, I'm Mike Renfro, Tennessee Tech University. Uh, I am effectively a one-man HPC operation, and I've had a student worker or two at the most for the last couple of years. I've been doing this full-time since 2017. And we are decidedly a small operation in terms of capacity, of node count, of all of that kind of stuff, and also on budget. And so, you know, contra the joke of people that have more money than sense, we are definitely not those people because we have practically no money to throw at things. Uh, so let me get my keyboard back together. All right. So this is more or less the state we're in right now. Uh, we have an older cluster that is over on this right-hand side of the slide that is all in orange and a blue file server. Uh, file server came in from Dell as a pro-deploy option uh, alongside our compute nodes and management nodes and login server that was all going to run Bright 8, 44 nodes in total, 44 compute nodes and GPU nodes in total plus a management server and a login server. Uh, 2021, we got an NSF uh, Campus Cyber Infrastructure Award for adding some beefier com uh, GPU and compute nodes. Uh, we bought 10 because they uh, we still ran out our budget practically, uh, but they're much beefier nodes than we had before because they've got more RAM, AMD processors, dual A100s. 
uh, they're the do everything nodes and they are going to be over here in the blue and we were migrating to open HPC over that one and also for some other reasons we've also componentized out some other things so that's where we're at right now we are gradually phasing out the bright stuff uh, and merging the old compute capacity into the new setup and so why did we end up on bright well in part because when I was helping spec this system out in 2016, while I was in my previous job, I figured whatever poor fool was going to end up with this uh, position and running our HPC, I didn't want to have them have to do everything from scratch. And I had reasonably good experience with Bright on a previous consulting gig. And then as it turns out, a year later, I'm the one that saddled with the Bright cluster um, up, upon everything else. Um, and so... We, we, we rolled with that for a while. Uh, Dell Pro Deploy, because we basically, it was, a, it was gonna be a high availability file server. That is something that we had never done before on our own. Uh, and again, trying not, to, uh, trying not to hang everything on one person any more than we had to. So we let them configure that. And you know it passed the acceptance test before I got hired, but then I find out later, they missed a net mask uh, value. Uh, they forgot to fix a firewall rule for file locking. Uh, and we had to kill high availability because high availability was killing itself. Uh, many of our users are not terribly sophisticated and it's all the compute hardware is an abstraction. And so there were times when somebody would fire off, you know, hundreds of tasks, all talking to the same disk array of spinning storage, the load average would increase. The other half of the high availability server pair would, would see that the primary, the active server was not uh, responding in time and decided that it would power cycle it and take over the workload. And then five minutes later, when the old node would get powered back up, it would see that the currently active node is also very busy and not responding and decide to power cycle it. And so, you know, we ended up with, you know, dueling, shooting each other in the head nodes uh for a while uh, and so we had to kill high availability and if i had to do this over again i would find some kind of scale out nas device uh rather than uh the high availability pair uh maintenance on it it's also such a single point of failure for us that you know we worry about doing updates on it about worrying about breaking things not be able to recover it and so uh partially for technical reasons and partially for internal organizational reasons, we're probably going to transition away from that. Why didn't we stick with Bright in general as we move forward with the second cluster? Mostly cost to benefit analysis. For the most part, we were only really leveraging Bright for provisioning. We also had some issues with how that was operating and with the with the new licensing model that they're going to with the GPU licensing and everything else, it was going to be exorbitant for us to go to that. Uh, and so, in addition to all of of, of switching away from Bright to Open HPC, uh, I also wanted to take the opportunity to get away from our everything cluster management sits on one physical server. Uh, and it's all together and please don't touch it and don't don't try and break anything because it holds everything and try and componentize this out and containerize it where I can. And so we've been using Puppet in the enterprise side of IT here for the last couple, three years. I used it a fair amount in my previous position starting in 2007 or so on and off. And so anything that was not truly HPC specific and exclusive to HPC. I wanted to try and break that out onto different virtual machines under Puppet management. So our MariaDB server for Slurm is a container on a Docker host. The container and the Docker host are both managed in Puppet. Active Directory joins, how we handle sudo, the Docker host itself, all of that in Puppet. And, you know, my joke is while we're, we did do Ansible for a period of a couple years, shortly after I changed jobs over here, um, but Puppet kind of fit what I wanted to do more. And we, again, we're a small group, even for the enterprise, about seven people at this point uh, in systems administration for the whole university. And so I didn't like having to go back to machines in Ansible and reapply the settings. 
And to make that automated, the amount of extra effort that was going to be made me think I might as well just run Puppet. Um, and so there we are there. And so Simone already gave an overview of more or less what we do in Puppet, because I think it's more, more or less everybody does in Puppet. Uh, we use the R10K program that will map branches of a, of a Git repository of configurations into different environments. We can point machines into those environments. Uh, now, these, these are not our compute nodes. I'll get to that here in a minute. But our regular stateful servers, we, we point them into different environments to do new service development. And when, when that's all debugged, we merge everything back into the production branch. One thing that Simone did not uh, highlight too much in his is in order to sort of componentize what goes into a server and how to sort of, you know, uh, factor things out and not have a lot of copy paste. Uh, I got into the roles and profiles method uh, in the last couple of years on this one so that we can basically have componentized settings across servers. And my management server for, for Werewolf and Slurm scheduling is more complicated than I can fit on a couple of slides. So I just lightly edited down just an NFS server that we have to handle high availability Slurm scheduling. And so all it has to do is offer up one NFS export and otherwise look like a normal system. And so the idea with the role and profile is we can assign a server a role. In this case, it's an NFS state save server. That role includes profiles that are shared across different, different uh, contexts. So our base environment, fail to ban, uh, security baselines, uh, post fix, and then another profile that is specific to a machine that's going to be an NFS state safe server. And then that one can be pretty simple. In this case, it just has my pseudo rules for the HPC environment. It sets up the NFS server and exports the one folder that it needs to. And then if there's a change that we need to make to the security baseline or anything else, we make it once and every machine that includes that as a profile automatically gets that update within the 30 minutes or so that it takes uh, for them to check back in. Now, for the things that are HPC specific, Werewolf, uh, Slurm, and the compute nodes, we swapped over with that to open HPC. And so I had some work a few years ago with the, uh, the Exceed uh, Cyber Resource in Integration Group uh, for about a year working on their Exceed compatible basic cluster Ansible project. Um, and so that got my feet wet better with OpenHPC. It's easy enough to test out and the price was, was right for us. And it was perfectly functional uh, for what we needed. Uh, I got good enough at doing regular slurm management to where we were going to be able to handle that. And I mostly just wanted much cleaner provisioning than I was getting on our bright setup. Now, we do have this one little uh, stepchild Ubuntu web server off to the side uh, because I have always been a fan of this Slurm web package that came from uh, EDF in France, basically the French uh, uh, in, uh, Nuclear Energy Authority, if I remember right. Very friendly view of the cluster, the queue states, absolute nightmare to get running under Red Hat. We found somebody's documentation for seven. It worked. Um, eight was just being a no-go, and it it made more sense just to hang a web server off to the side, purely for the purpose of running Slurm Web. We we've you know for the critical purpose of running Slurm Web, it does a few other things. Uh, looks like in the last month that that project is under new management, and hopefully the 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 packaging situation will improve. Where we hope to be in you know this summer or thereabouts is I want to get all the bright stuff out of the way entirely. I want to merge our other, our older compute nodes into OpenHPC2 and uh, get our, our Slurm Web VM under puppet management. And we're most of the way there. Uh, it's just a matter of finding the time to transition people uh, and, and, and do, that, do that environment. Uh, we also have some other dashboards that's proxied through that web VM that I originally built for Slurm Web. It's a mix of net data for live stats from compute nodes, telegraph influx and Grafana for the long-term storage and the presentation. 
Telegraph Influx and Grafana are all running in containers and puppetized. And then for the pro mostly for the provisioning side of the place, we have uh, a fair number of Python scripts that my, my first student worker and I worked to, together on for probably a year and a half, uh, bringing up this new cluster. And so the idea with that is I had a repository several years ago for building shore wall firewalls in a Debian environment. Um, and among other things, we could have a single database of nodes, of, of hosts, host names, IPs, MAC addresses, DNS aliases. And from that single thing, we could write a couple of Python scripts, not exactly with an API, uh, but from that single source of truth, we could generate our DHCP settings, our DNS settings, Pixie Linux configs, everything else. And so we took that idea at its core and said, how can we leverage that to deal with our four types of compute hardware, or at least werewolf hardware, uh, VMs, Epic three nodes with A100s, Haswells with K80s, Haswells with nothing, um, at least two roles. And we wanted to sort of make that as configurable as possible. And this will not be the prettiest Python code. I have three degrees in engineering and my student was an undergraduate uh, about to graduate in computer science. And so I'm certain there's better data structures for doing some of this, but we tried to make it something that we could just sort of keep our keep keep a handle on. And so we basically had a dictionary of our 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 VNFSs, our chroots, our change our change root environments for our different werewolf images. And so we had one that's our baseline for no GPU, and then we've got a couple others that are for the K80 or A100 machines. We got to have different NVIDIA drivers for the each of those. And so we have to keep track of if you're a K80 node or an A100 node, which driver do you get? And then our node dictionary looks more or less like this. And so, and again, the nice thing with having this all in Python of, of things that we wrote is we can sort of ad hoc extend things as we find that we need to be more flexible with our, with our architecture. And so, you know, at, at one point, all of our nodes that we considered had InfiniBand. Eventually, we wanted to make a virtual machine login node. We wanted to make some test VMs that we could just completely blow away anytime we wanted to. And so we don't always have InfiniBand devices. Uh, we sometimes have extra network interfaces so that our nodes can connect back to the old file server unless they're directly InfiniBand connected. Uh, and so, you know, we can define this uh, taxonomy nomenclature for our nodes as we need it. And then we have these Python scripts that import things from the node database file. And then we can go from there to do the, the, the making the cheroots. We can also, uh, for example, when we do most of our work, when we do a rebuild, we rebuild the non-GPU cheroot first. Then once that's done, we completely R sync that entire cheroot over into two other folders, one for each GPU type. And then we can go into each of those cheroots, install the GPU drivers, do any other minor tweaks in there, and then build things for all the nodes. Um, let's see. And then from that, we can figure out which VNFS they need to use, whether it's a GPU specific one or not set the werewolf accordingly, uh, network interfaces. We can decide that this machine has a role, it's a login server or it's not right now. And so we have different security configurations and access lists allowed on the login node versus the computes. And so we account for that from that dictionary as well. Um, let me check the chat as soon as I see where that, I don't know where my chat window went. Um, honestly, I'm just going to stop sharing. Maybe I'm going to find things then. Okay. So I'm done with the actual slides. Um, questions, things I absolutely forgot to cover. 
Awesome. Thanks, Mike. And a reminder, folks, please unmute and state your name and institution uh, if you have a question. Uh, and if you don't have the ability to unmute, please do go ahead and ask your question in the chat. What questions do we have for, for Mike? And great talk, Mike. That was awesome. Really appreciate how detailed you went into the, the nuts and bolts of the configuration. Scripts may be able to made avail made made available after I have a chance to do some cleanup. They are functional. They are probably not even remotely optimized. All right. What questions do folks have for Mike? Seems like you've answered all the questions in your presentation, Mike. I must have. Yeah, 100%, it was very thorough. All right, last chance for questions, folks. All right, so with that, I'm going to switch over and just provide an update on the survey itself. We are continuing to collect data from the survey. We're getting a lot of interesting results and we'd like to host another one of these sessions if folks are willing to provide it. Uh, you can find a link to the survey in the call doc, um, but let me paste a link in here. And we thought it would be a good idea to share some of the preliminary information. So before I do so, uh, let's have a hand, a quiet hand for those who are muted uh, for Simon Gilbo and Mike Renfrew, uh, Mike Renfro for presenting today. Really appreciate it, both of you. Um, yeah, it was highly insightful and certainly an important discussion within the realm of our systems facing track. Oh, let me just wrestle with presentation mode here. All right. Can everybody see my screen? Can okay, see some nods. All right. So this is our cluster resource management survey results. And this is just a light preview. We'd like to do a little bit more data analysis and proper presentation with fancy graphs and whatnot. But this is just a bit of a, a teaser, uh, really to entice people to fill it out when they have a chance. Uh, so no huge surprises here, uh, quite the range with regards to the primary tools being used by respondents. Uh, as we heard today, um, with regards to Puppet and XCAP being used, OpenHPC as well, those are amongst what is being currently leveraged. We have uh, Ansible, Bright, uh, Cray on there, of course, for those folks that have uh, the privilege of administering such a system, a little bit of jealousy in my voice there. Um, secondary tools being used also, we see repeat uh, of a lot of what we saw on the previous page. Uh, interestingly enough, we don't see uh, OpenHPC as a secondary tool in any of the responses, which is kind of straightforward given how all encompassing that solution tends to be. Uh, for some of the additional tools used, this is an additional to, to primary and secondary, we see kind of a, the emergence of some homegrown and custom tools, and also some kind of general system administration virtual machine tools such as Promox. There are others listed too, but Promox came up a fair bit. For length of use, um, quite the range. Uh, most folks have only been using their primary tool between one and three years. Uh, indicating kind of, yeah, that shift isn't all that uncommon with regards to cluster management approaches. That is with the limited data we have so far. And some highlights on some of the cluster management tools that we've been submitting, seen submitting so far. So XCAT, which we heard about today, uh, pretty straightforward with regards to the strengths, mature, open source, vendor agnostic, uh, capability for mass deployments and handles hard hardware rebuilds well. And then some of the challenges, uh, a note that these challenges were submitted by those who 
are using it as their primary tool. So, you know, troubleshooting, infrequency of updates, slow development, lack of ARM support. Open HPC, uh, free, open source, multi-purpose, uh, and the availability of prepackaged tools and modules. An interesting note with regards to the Open HPC crowd is that 100% of respondents indicated they are continuing use on current and new, new deployments, where we saw a bit of a range for the other solutions that were in play. Uh, challenges, complex, lack of commercial support, and difficult to integrate with other tools. Ansible, also not a whole lot of um, divergence from other answers, but the one administering network bit included in there that it can be used for more than just HPC. And the only challenges that people listed, and almost everyone listed this uh, with regards to Ansible, was the potential for some complexity there. And uh, Puppet, we had uh, again a pretty narrow list of strengths here. So scalability and flexibility is the strengths and reason for use. Uh, and the weaknesses were also um, the uh, complexity bit. And we'd like to give a proper presentation on the data we've collected. So please do fill out the survey if you haven't already. If you know of other folks that are administering HPC systems, we'd really love to hear from them. Uh, there is an option in the survey to provide a lightning talk like you've heard here today. Although I'd say these are these were really robust lightning talks. And with that, thank you everyone for your time. Please do fill out the call doc if you haven't already. And let's hear it again for Simon and Mike for presenting today. Thank you both and see you all out there in the ether. <laughs>